You're listening to a special podcast of Damien Barr's Literary Salon, and I am, who else, Damien Barr. You're about to listen to Maggie O'Farrell taking us all the way back to the 17th century for her novel Hamnet, which is about the story behind the world's greatest drama, Hamlet. It's about the death of a boy, it's about love, it's about grief, it's got a sex scene with apples that she doesn't read out but which does appear in the novel. It's incredible, she's wonderful, enjoy it. We have our final guest um, with a, a book that is astonishing. I was just saying to her earlier that she has to take me as a date to the booker when she wins it. Um, I was like, never mind your husband. I'll be there. Um, this is a proof of the book. It's called Hamnet, um, which isn't a typo. Uh, as she explains at the beginning, Hamnet and Hamlet were interchangeable names at the time. But anyway, Maggie has launched her last three novels here, and she's returning tonight uh, to premiere Hamnet. And I did think it was her first foray into historical fiction, and then I thought, well, Esme Lennox is set in the 1930s. But this is 1596, so it's even deeper history. Um, and it's in Stratford-upon-Avon. A young girl, Judith, starts to feel unwell. She goes to bed, and her twin brother, Hamnet, is distraught and leaves the house trying to find help. Their mother, Agnes, is a mile away, uh, tending her garden where she grows medicinal herbs. And their father is in London. This is the heart-stopping drama behind the world's most famous play. Please welcome Maggie O'Farrell. They're quite a rowdy crowd, aren't they? They are. It's a Friday night. There was They're definite excited. whooping. People don't usually whoop at literary there's events. Often, there's often a whoopette, but there's Is definitely there a, much more whooping this That evening. was a proper whoop. Um, you're going to read a couple of bits for us. You were going to read just one, and then I bullied you into And then you, you did bully me, actually. Yeah, I'd like to know. There's bullying in the workplace going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I will read a bit, uh, two bits, because Damien told me I had to. And what Damien says goes... In the Savoy. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, a bit at the beginning, uh, where, as Damien said, Hamnet is running about the house trying to find someone to help his sister who's unwell. And he's just come across his grandfather, who is the town's most successful glover. The room is filled with gloom, coverings pulled over most of the windows. His grandfather is standing with his back towards him in a crouched position, fumbling with something. Papers, a cloth bag, counters of some sort. Hamnet gives a polite cough. His grandfather wheels around, his face wild, furious, his arm flailing through the air as if warding off an assailant. Who's there, he cried. It's me, Hamnet. His grandfather sits down with a thud. You scared the wits out of me, he cries. Whatever do you mean, creeping about like that? I'm sorry, Hamnet said. I was calling and calling, but no one answered. Judith is unwell, and they've gone out. His grandfather speaks over him with a curt flick of his wrist. What do you want with all those women, anyway? He seizes the neck of a pitcher and aims it towards a cup. The liquid, ale, Hamnet thinks, slops out precipitously, some into the cup and some onto the papers on the table, causing his grandfather to curse and dab at them with his sleeve. For the first time, it occurs to Hamnet that his grandfather might be drunk. Do you know where they've gone? Hamnet asks. Eh? His grandfather says, still mopping at his papers. His anger at their spoiling seems to unsheath itself and stretch out from him like a rapier. Hamnet can feel the tip of it wander about the room, seeking an opponent. Don't stand there gawping, his grandfather hisses. Help me. Hamnet shuffles forward a step, and then another. He is wary, his father's words circling in his mind. Stay away from your grandfather when he is in one of his black humours. Be sure to stand clear of him. Hamnet believes he is keeping his word. He is well back. He is at the other side of the fireplace. His grandfather couldn't reach him here, even if he tried. His grandfather is draining his cup with one hand and shaking the drops off a sheet of paper with the other. Take this, he orders, holding out the page. Hamlet bends forward, not moving his feet, and takes it with the very tip of his fingers. His grandfather's eyes are slitted and watchful. His tongue pokes out the side of his mouth. 
He sits in his chair, hunched, an old, sad toad on a stone. And this, his grandfather holds out, another paper. Hamlet bends forward in the same way, keeping the necessary distance. He thinks of his father, how he would be proud of him, how he would be pleased. Quick as a fox, his grandfather makes a lunge. Everything happens so fast that afterwards, Hamlet won't be sure in what sequence it all occurred. The page swings to the floor between them. His grandfather's hand seizes him by the wrist, then the elbow, hauling him forwards. Into the gap, the necessary space his father had told him to observe. And his other hand, which still holds the cup, is coming up fast. Hamnet is aware of streaks in his vision, red, orange, the colours of fire streaming in from the corner of his eye before he feels the pain. It is a sharp, clubbed, jabbing pain. The rim of the cup has struck him just below the eyebrow. That'll teach you, his grandfather is saying in a calm voice, to creep up on people. Thank you. Thank you. Are we doing another bit then? Okay. Um, so this, uh, what I'm about to read now, occurs about 15 years earlier from that scene we just read. Um, and it's a Latin tutor who's looking out the window and he sees, uh, well, anyway, I'll see, he sees someone who becomes quite important in the story. It's Hamlet's mum. It's the spoiler. Future mother, <laughs> I should say. On a morning in early spring, a Latin tutor is standing at the windows of, of Hewland's farm, absently tugging on the loop hoop through his left ear. He is watching the trees. The boys are behind him. They are conjugating verbs, temporarily unheard by the tutor, who is intent on the startling contrast between the sharply blue spring sky and the new leaf green of the forest. The colours seem to fight, vying for supremacy, vibrancy. The green versus the blue, one against the other. The children's Latin verbs wash over him, through him, like wind through the trees. He is about to turn and face his pupils when he sees, from the trees, a figure emerge. For a moment, the tutor believes it to be a young man. He is wearing a cap, a leather jerkin, gauntlets. He moves out of the trees with a brand of entitlement covering the ground with booted strides. There is some kind of bird on his outstretched fist, chestnut brown with a creamy white breast, its wings spotted with black. It sits hunched, subdued, its body swaying with the movement of its companion, its familiar. The tutor is imagining this person, this hawk-taming youth, to be some kind of factotum to the farm, or a relative to the family, a visiting cousin, perhaps. Then he registers the long plait hanging over the shoulder, reaching past the waist, the jerkin laced tight around a form that curves suspiciously inwards at the middle. He sees the skirts, which had been bunched up, now hastily being dragged down around the stockings. He sees a pale, oval face under the cap, an arched brow. He moves closer to the glass, leaning on the sill, and watches as the woman moves from the, right, from the right to the left of the window frame, her bird riding on her fist, her skirt swishing around her boots. Then she enters the farmland, the farmyard, moves through the chicken and geese around the side of the house, and is gone. He straightens, his frown vanishing, a smile beginning to form under his scant beard. Behind him, the room has fallen silent. He recalls himself, the lessons, the boys, the verb conjugation. He turns, he arches his fingers together as he imagines a tutor ought to do, as his own masters at school did not, not so long ago. Excellent, he says to them. They look towards him, plants turning to the sun. He smiles at their soft, unformed faces, pale as unrisen dough in the light from the windows. He pretends not to see that the younger brother is being poked under the table with a peeled stick, and that the elder has filled his slate with a pattern of repleated loops. Now, he says to them, I would like you to work on a translation of the following sentence. I thank you, sir, for your kind letter. They begin to labour over their slates, the elder and stupidest, the stupid tutor knows, breathing through his mouth, the younger laying his head down on his arm. And really, what sense is there in giving these boys these lessons? Aren't they destined to be farmers like their father and their older brothers? But then, what use has it been to him? Years and years at the grammar school, and look where it has got him, a smoke-hazed hall coaxing the sons of a sheep farmer to learn conjugation and word order. He waits until the boys have half-finished this exercise before he says, what is the name of that girl, the one with the bird? Thank you. Thank you. So her name is Agnes, but I'd always known her as Anne. 
Anne Hathaway of Anne Hathaway's Cottage, yeah. Anne Hathaway's Pizzeria, <laughs> Anne Hathaway's <laughs> Mini Cabs, Tea Towels. Tea Towels. Yeah, lot of those. Yeah, so w where does the Agnes come from? Well, as I was researching the book, um, I discovered that, uh, so a year before she marries William Shakespeare, her father dies, and in his will, he names her as Agnes. Um, which in Elizabethan times would have been pronounced a bit like the French, so it would have been Agnes or Anis. Right. Um, but I thought, well, if anyone's going to know her name, it's going to be her dad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so why? Yeah. <laughs> why is she always called Anne Hathaway, when actually maybe we should all be calling her Agnes Shakespeare, which I think um, is probably her name. The Latin tutor, yeah. the son, the brother the tradeless wastrel um, is never named William Shakespeare. That's the first time I've heard you say it when we've been talking about it. You never say Will William, you never, and, you, and you never say Shakespeare in the whole book. And you're mm -hmm. quite ingenious about the ways that you manage to avoid saying it. Um, how and why? Or rather, just why? Well, <laughs> well, partly, I mean, partly because, I mean, the one major reason is because I found it impossible to sit typing a story saying, and then William Shakespeare got up and had breakfast. You just think, oh, <laughs> what's going on? You know, like, you can't write that sentence. Nobody can, because it's just ridiculous, obviously. And the other, the other aspect was that I really wanted, um, I wanted us all, I think I wanted myself and also the readers to completely divorce what we think we know about him mm. um, and the kind of myths surrounding him, particularly the myths surrounding his wife. Because... You know, everything we have known about her, and in most biographies you ever read about Shakespeare, and in any, from sitcoms to really, really kind of scholarly biographies, the myth about her is always the same, that she is this older peasant woman who lures this young boy into marriage, and then he runs off to London and hates her and never wants to see her ever again and leaves her behind. And, you know, I think, I don't think that's true. I don't believe it for a minute. And so me wanting to give her her proper name... Um, was a kind of invitation to us all to maybe rethink about rethink her and reimagine her and say, is this true? You know, for me, it isn't true because, you know, I mean, there's, there's the whole will thing. Everybody says, oh, well, he calls her her wife and he only leaves her his second best bed. But, you know, I mean, at the, at the time at which he died, he was, a multi, he was the equivalent of a multimillionaire. I mean, he was very canny with his money. He was a very good, hugely successful businessman. Mm. And he sent every penny he earned back to Stratford. And when he retired from the stage, he went back to live in Stratford with his wife. And that doesn't, neither of those actions seem to strike me as the man, actions of a man who hates his wife. He feels entrapped by, right. yeah. She's an amazing character and I absolutely loved her. She's an astonishingly brilliant mother. She reminded me of both the mothers we talked about earlier tonight. She's, she has these powers. She's kind of witchy. No. Um, she she has this thing where she touches people on the hand, uh, just in the in between their thumb and their fourth finger, and she can feel all that's in them. And she falls in love with the Latin tutor because she says he has more inside him that's unknown than, than anybody else that she touched. Um, is her witchiness entirely invented? Well, it's funny. I mean, you know, the the thing about when you're writing or researching about Shakespeare is that there's very very, very little to actually go on. There's all this, you know, you read a biography of him and a lot of it actually reads like a novel <laughs> because, I mean, he left so few traces of his life. You know, they're very, very scant. There's only about, I can't remember how many, if there are any Shakespeare scholars in the audience, but there are so few, uh, you know, examples of his signature even. Um, compared to his father, who we, you know, I've invented in that first scene there, who left an enormous paper trail because he was always having struggles with the law. He kept breaking the law and he kept getting summoned and fined. And, but his son, William, he, there's barely anything about him, actually, which is intriguing Was that as intri a intriguing or, or, or difficult? I mean, so often the challenge when you're writing about history is yeah. to find the gaps, is to find the spaces. And it seems like it's this is a story where there space. are more spaces than there are. I mean, you know, it's only... I mean, he's, he, not only did he leave, not leave a paper trail, he left no provision to ensure that his work, um, you know, lived on. The only reason we have his plays is because his two friends put together the first folio after he died. So someone like Ben Johnson or Christopher Marlowe, mm. they made their own. They made their own first folio equivalent before they died. But Shakespeare didn't, which in itself is quite fascinating. 
you said in the, in the introduction to this book that you'd wanted to write it for 30 years. Yeah. What took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've been really obsessed with the idea of Hamnet and Hamlet, the play, since I, well, I studied it for my hires, my Scottish hires, when I was Me 16. Too. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Um, and my teacher then, who again is actually one of those brilliant teachers who changed my life, um, he told us, he's just mentioned in passing that Shakespeare had had a son called Hamnet. And even age 16, I just thought, what, what the, you know, how, what does that mean? Why, how could you do that? And why? Why? Why did he do that? And, and also the idea that this boy had died. You know, I'm sorry if that's a spoiler, but he dies age 11. <laughs> He's dead. He's dead, I'm um, afraid, sorry. Um, and it just fascinated me. And it is a book that I have wanted to write for a really long time. And particularly have in the last... Have you started and stopped it? Yeah. So I started it. I mean, I've researched it and I've read about it for a, quite a long time. And then I started it. I was actually I'm poised to start it. And I had a plan where, you know, because, I mean, the decision with a story like this is, you know, it's so enormous and the time scale of it is enormous. Mm. Um, and your decision, your first decision is always at what point on this kind of linear scale do I jump in? Is it at the end? Is it right at the beginning? Is it the middle? And I did, I started something and, and I stopped for two reasons because I thought this is the wrong point. And I'd written about 15,000 words at this point um, and I thought, no, this is wrong. This is the wrong part. And also, <laughs> I had this weird superstitious thing where I couldn't write it until my son was past the age of 11. Until he was older than Hamlet was when he died. Yeah. I know that sounds really nuts, but I just couldn't do it because I knew that I was going to have to put myself inside the skin of a woman who watches her son die. Mm. And I knew that, obviously, I was going to be thinking about my son and how I would feel. And I thought, I cannot do that until I know he's safe. And so my son did actually take the piss out of me for quite a long time about this. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, you know what you're going to be doing on my 12th birthday? <laughs> he said, I'm not going to get a 12th birthday party, am I? <laughs> But actually, even then, I mean, he's now six foot and 16. He's way past the age of, you know, the Hamlet danger. Not that there was a huge amount of danger that he was going to die of the Black Death, but you never know. You never know. You never know. You never know. And it's not worth tempting fate. Um, so, yeah, that was another reason. But, he, but it just, I don't know what it was, actually, and I couldn't, and it, between every book... So, was it and then the I, fear of Shakespeare, the fear of... It was a slight fear of Shakespeare, but also fear of the 16th century, and mm. also fear, it seemed like terrible chutzpah in a way to write about Shakespeare. I mean, it, you know, who does that? I mean, straight white men. <laughs> Often. But I just thought, um, every time I thought about it, I would be, you know, I'd be lured in because I think I'm fascinated by this story. Then I think, oh, no, I can't. Can't yeah. do it. And so I wrote, I wrote Instructions for Heat Wave instead of writing this. And then I wrote, um, this must be the place instead of writing this. And I would do a bit more research. I think, no, no, I can't. And then I thought, I even wrote a memoir, which I always said I'd never do. So it's a massive, you know... Um, Three books as a diversion. Yeah, yeah. From, 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 from from Basically, anything else. I could do anything <laughs> other than that. And then I thought, well, actually, when I finished my memoir, I thought, I'm either going to have to do it now or never. You know, I've got to piss or get off the pot, basically. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I had this idea. I thought, OK, I'm going to start with him. It's just got to be him. And he's going to walk down this flight of stairs. And I wrote that scene. And I got to the point <laughs> where he's walking down the wooden stairs. And I got to the point where his feet reached the floor of the house and I thought I don't know what the floor of the house would be I've no idea is it wood is it what is it and I thought oh my god I can't write this book I don't even know what the floor is made of <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to Stratford that was my right. answer I thought okay I've got to go there and you know for a man who is so mysterious and you know we'd known so little about him the astonishing thing about going to Stratford is his house is there yeah. unchanged it is right there and you can just walk in and there are people in these rooms who will tell you anything you want to know. You describe one of the chairs in one of the rooms as having apple, apple soft arms, mm. and it felt like to me like that was a chair that you'd seen or touched, or yep. maybe even sat there in when you were in the house. On the upper story of uh, what's called Anne Hathaway's cottage, which I can't say, Hewlands <laughs> uh, Farm. Yeah, it's there. It's apparently, this chair he wrote in. But really? Who knows? That's what they say. I mean, the thing is, there's so much myth surrounding it. Yeah. They, and it's funny because you go into the museum and they say this is a ring we found in the graveyard and we think it belonged to him <laughs> you think it would be nice if it did but <laughs> we I mean, don't know I can understand having read, read the novel and understanding you know, William Shakespeare's experience there and going to Stratford why he wanted to escape it I think it's really Brexity um, and I suspect 
I suspect, I suspect it always has been. I think since 1596, know? it's been a Brexit place. Do you know and that that's people, why he wanted to run away to London. There have been thousands and thousands of words devoted to how did this Glover's boy go from Stratford to becoming this incredible playwright on the London stage. But maybe Damien's got it. It was just a bit Brexity. I think, <laughs> I, I think the place you described was, though, because, I mean, the, the, it's very inward. <laughs> oh, this is really bad. But it's very, it's very kind of... Everybody's looking. They're all obsessed by one another. By, uh, by, um, it was a small community. Yeah, and they yeah. know everything. And he can't escape the story of his father, who's been disgraced um, mm. by, you know, doing some some con merchant stuff with some wool. Mm. Um, but, you know, he, he's trapped by his, his family and he wants to be a writer and he wants to leave, although he doesn't really yet know that he wants to be a writer. Um, but one of the things that's most striking in this novel is that it's Agnes who sets him free. Mm. She says, you know, she, she, she senses that he's never going to be truly happy there with her. Yeah. Well, it, it does fascinate me because in everything you read about him, the, the, the kind of underlying sort of criticism of her seems, well, what did he see in her? Why would he marry her? But Jermaine Greer wrote a very good book about her called Shakespeare's Wife. And she says, actually, what we should be asking is, why did she marry him? Mm. You know, <laughs> she was 26. Her family was quite prosperous. I mean, yeah, they were rural, but they had quite a lot. They had quite a large estate. They had a big farm. And 26 is about the age that Elizabethan did get married. Um, so, and if you look at it that way, he was penniless. His family was in, in shame. His father had been a bailiff and he'd been a very high standing man and he'd fallen from grace. Mm. And they were, you know, hard up. You know, his younger brothers, he, the mother, father didn't have the money to send them to a grammar school. Um, so I thought that's a really interesting idea. Why would she? Why would she marry this 18 year old boy who had no trade? And I thought, well, she must have, maybe Sense. she saw something in him. I mean, how extraordinary must he have been? Yeah. I mean, like any other playwright who was writing at that time, they'd been to university, like Ben Johnson and Kit Marlowe, and Shakespeare hadn't. He just got a grammar school education. Um, in the reading that you shared, it struck me for the first time hearing you read it aloud that when he's the Latin teacher and he steeples his fingers to the, the children, um, he's acting. And in this book, we meet him for the first time really as an actor. He's, he's acting for a lot of his life, um, mm. especially with his father, who is just mm. abusive. Right? Mm. Um, and then he goes to London at, and as, a, as a glove trader, but becomes an actor and, and then a writer. And I'd never really thought of him in that way. And in this book, it's really mm. clear. Well, he settled when he... I mean, the real Shakespeare, when he moved to London, he settled in the area where all the tanneries were. So it is possible. I don't know. There is a theory that he moved there as part of his father's business or an attempt to kind of salvage his father's business and then got distracted by the stage. But the truth is, nobody knows. So that's why it's fun as a novelist, because, you, you know, like you say, you find all these gaps and you think, I could just fill it up, make stuff up. Yeah. Are you ready for the kind of Shakespeare lovers who are going to come and say that this is sort of dreadful <laughs> and you can't say these things about our Probably, national treasure? But the thing is, it's, it's a novel, you know, and he's named in it. And, he, yes, you know, just it's just, I mean, it is a novel. It's not, it's not, it's not a scholar. I'm not a scholar. It's scholarly work. It's not meant to be a biography. It's just a story that was suggested to me by the death of this child that not many people know about, weirdly. Do you know, it's funny, one of the weird reactions I've had to it is that several people have said to me, how dare you, how dare you make up the idea that Shakespeare had a son called Hamlet? And I say, no, but he did. And they say, well, <laughs> but how do you know? And I say, well, I've, I've seen the record in the parish register. It, there's no doubt that he did have a son and he was called Hamlet. <laughs> but they seem quite outraged. That I'm, and I say, no, no, it's true, he really was. Um, did you visit his grave? You described the funeral. Um, his grave, no one knows where it is. So right. you know, the, whole, the rest of the family's graves are there. Yeah. So the Williams is there and Ag Anne, Agnes, and then his two sisters. But um, I mean, it's possible that he was buried and there's one theory that someone told me um, that it's possible that he was dug up and, dis and disinterred for him to go in the grave with his mother. Ah, uh, that would be very But sweet. we don't know where his grave is. No one knows where Hamnet is. Bit. But he was buried in the churchyard because it's, it's in the register, but nobody, you, there's no marker of it now. It's um, an astonishing description of the way Agnes holds on to her children, both of them, the twins, and the way that she fights uh, to save them. And I think your memoir sheds some light on that urgency of feeling. I really was taken back when I was reading that scene to you in the memoir Fighting for your fighting for your child, fighting mm. to, to to keep her alive, and it it it. 
that memoir shed a new light on that on that aspect of that feeling for me, mm. for you in the novel. Well, I think it's true. I mean, I think there is n- probably no worse fear for a parent than the idea that you'd have to bury your child. I can't imagine anything that would be worse. Mm. And so, and that does run through the, the middle of the book, you know. Um, and actually, yeah, that whole middle section where he dies and then she has to get him ready for burial because that's what would have happened. Mm. I had to write those sections in really short bursts. I wrote them in about 20 minutes and I had to write them outside. It was really weird. Outside. And we, yeah, I wrote them outside, even in quite pretty cold Scotland in the winter. We had this kind of very dilapidated greenhouse which is falling down and I sat in there when it was really cold. And I, that's the only place I could write it because I thought I can't, I can't write this in the house because it was too, I don't know, it felt too poisonous in a sense. I thought I can't imagine this and I can't write it sitting in the house where my children live. I had to write it outside. But the other thing that I did, so part of the research I did for the book was um, was obviously reading a lot, and then I went to Stratford. Um, but one of the things I did was that I planted, um, I cultivated my own medicinal home garden because I wanted to understand the labour involved. I wanted to know what it would have been like. I thought the only way I can really imagine what Agnes was like was to do it myself. Um, and I, just to say that I am really not a horticulturalist at all, <laughs> I'm really rubbish at it. So I did, I, I, built, I created my own garden and then I went on a course to learn how to make traditional herbal medicines because I thought I really want to understand. But also I want to understand, you know, because I, as you just said in the memoir, you know, one of my kids does have a life-threatening medical condition and, you know, every minute of every day I am so grateful for modern medicine that mm. saves her life on a regular basis. So I was trying to imagine what it would be like to have, and you know, looking at this patch of ground and you have all these plants in it, traditional sort of Elizabethan remedies, and I thought, imagine if this is all you had, this is it, to stop death coming for your children. This is the only defence you have. God. Um, I'm just thinking about your little garden in Edinburgh and how, how, how bad it would have been. Um, bless you. Trying to grow anything up there. Not, not easy. It's not the Beach Grove surprised. Garden. Um, you said you were scared of the 16th century, mm. um, writing it. What, 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 how did you overcome that when you were doing it? Because it does read... It's, it has that kind of Mantel gloss of contemporary English. There's no these or those or yees or oh, ye yeah. oldies no, or anything awful like that. Um, when I told one of my friends... Um, that I was, <laughs> was going to write this book. Um, she's a very kind of no-nonsense Glaswegian. And she said, don't tell me. She said, don't you dare use the word Syrah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I promise you, there's no, I will Sarah. Never, there's no Syrah. There's there will, no won't Sarah. be any. But also, you know, you can't write that kind of cold Elizabethan language. I mean, it's just, it would be just horrific to write and horrific to even read on the page. <laughs> so no, you can't do it. But every word, I mean, I hope anyway, that I've, and I've been through it very carefully, and my brilliant editor has also been through it. We've tried to stop using a word that would have been anachronistic at the time. Mm. So there's one thing. But the amazing, the really odd thing about, you know, diving into writing something about the 16th century is that you have to completely relearn everything. So in a way, it's really good as a writer. You've got to completely forget all the stuff that, you know, normally buttresses you up and the, normal, the way you normally write metaphors or the, the mm. sort of tools you normally engage to write a scene because you can't use them you know you can't say something was like radio interference because it's not since it wasn't like radio interference. so you are completely stripped down you're almost it's almost like starting again it does at have the, a very, at the beginning down. it does have a stripped down quality to it and really there's one spare. yeah there's one sentence that i wrote and i was describing somebody playing with her dress and she folded it into concertina folds and my brilliant editor said, but note in the margin said, concertinas weren't invented till the 18th century. <laughs> I thought, damn, that's got to go. So anything like that, we ha- I had to go through and complete. So I spent a lot of time looking at the OED. <laughs> would, you, would you write that, would you write it the 16th century again? Would you, or would you go back even further, do you think? I don't know. I don't think I'd be as scared this time. And in mm. fact, one of the things I'm thinking about writing is writing a sequel to this, but I'm not sure yet. It would be less of a sequel, more of a twin. Explain. <laughs> So Judith. Yeah, because Judith and Susanna have quite interesting lives. They carry on. And just the idea of what happens later, much, much later in their lives. And also there is the, the 15,000 words which I discarded. Um, they, were, they began on Agnes's deathbed. And I was looking at them the other day and I thought, actually, maybe I'm not quite ready to let them all go yet. Oh, that's so exciting. Maybe. I haven't decided yet. I, mean, I might I'm... write another four books just to stop myself doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
this seems like a really good place to end. Please join me in thanking Maggie O'Farrell. Thank, Thank you very much. Janine Cummings and Kerry Hudson. You can come back on stage. <laughs>